Happy Sabbath to all of you and welcome to our guests. We have guests here from Alterboro, South Carolina and Columbia, Missouri, I've observed, and uh, perhaps some other exotic locations as well. Welcome. We also uh, give you greetings from enthusiastic brethren in Chicago and Milwaukee. As you heard of the announcements, we had some excellent uh, visitors and uh, everything went very well at both Chicago and Milwaukee. I had warned the audiences that, uh, of course, nothing can, bad can happen here in the Chicago area or in Milwaukee. And uh, I, as I normally do, I take a survey as how many of you have enough drinking water to last uh, a week. And uh, typically, uh, it's only about 10 or 15 percent of the audiences are prepared for any of these disasters. And then Monday morning, after the uh, special presentation in Milwaukee, as Mr. McNair mentioned, the announcements uh, was this a tremendous windstorm. It really was hurricane force winds of 75 miles an hour, and more than 550,000 uh, people were without, or that is homes, were without electricity for several days. Uh, one of our church members um, did have restored electricity after two and a half days, but she had to. Uh, uh, get rid of the uh, spoiled food that was uh, in the refrigerator. So again, we need to be prepared, and that was one of the themes that I was giving in the uh, lectures. But uh, Phil West, of course, is doing the follow-up. He'll be doing the one in Chicago today, so you can be praying for him, and uh, of course the one in Milwaukee tomorrow. And we all experience trials and tests, but how do we endure those trials and those tests? Some years ago in Southern California, I attended a funeral of 11 and a half year old Jessica Hart. She died of AIDS. She knew she was dying of AIDS. At the funeral service, it was an overflow crowd at Draper Mortuary in Ontario, California. Jessica wrote her own will. She planned her own funeral. And she asked her minister to officiate at her funeral. In the last few months of her life, she became blind. Many of us would ask the question, why would God let a little girl suffer and die like that? The most often asked questions in religion is just that. Why does God allow so much evil and suffering in the world? Can you explain the causes, the purposes, and the benefits of suffering? Mr. Mario Hernandez gave the biblical answer to that question in his inspiring sermon here just three weeks ago in a sermon titled, Why Suffering? Some of us have asked the same question about our own suffering. Why me, O oh Lord? Part of the answer is in the changes that may or may not have taken place in your own life as a result of your suffering. What changes have you made in your life as a result of your trials, your pain, and your suffering. Have you ever thought that there are benefits to suffering? The title of this sermon is The Lasting Lessons of Suffering. In the world today, we see the violence, the conflicts, the tribulations, and the victimization of millions, if not billions. We read in our newspapers about local tragedies, I read in a newspaper some time ago about two girls, 12 and 13, who were riding home in a school bus that were shot by boys on a bicycle. One girl was left in critical condition. There's no justification for the evil in the world. God is going to judge the incorrigibly wicked. He says, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord in Hebrews 10 and verse 30. So we think of the evil in the world, but do we realize that sometimes we ourselves have caused harm or pain or suffering to others by our sins? Have you ever caused emotional hurt or pain by angry words? I have, and I've had to repent of them. And I've had to repent of causing hurt and pain in others. But what lessons have you learned through pain and suffering? And the Bible shows there are many lessons that we can learn because we ourselves experience pain and suffering. I won't ask you to raise your hands, but how many of you have experienced some pain this past week? I uh, was, of course, we returned from uh, Milwaukee on Tuesday, 
and I was lifting our heavy suitcases, and I did it the wrong way, and I experienced some very strong pain. I won't tell you where I experienced the pain, but I experienced the pain. And what did I do? Well, I, of course, cried out to God. We'll see what our reactions to pains and trials should be in the rest of the sermon. We suffer in different ways. We suffer physically, mentally, spiritually, emotionally, socially, and even sometimes, as we heard in the sermonette, financially. But there are solutions, as we heard in the sermonette, for at least the financial suffering. And sometimes, without realizing it, we may alternate between the victim and the abuser. We may be abusing someone without our knowing it. Maybe we do know it. Or we may be the victim. There are common forms of abuse, spiritual abuse. Of course, the Pharisees were expert at that. There's verbal abuse. There's emotional abuse. Let's turn to 1 Peter, the first chapter, 1 Peter 1. We counted the cost when we were baptized. We realized, yes, Christians do suffer. In 1 Peter, the first chapter, starting with verse 6, Peter was writing to Christians who were experiencing trials, and he was giving them this encouraging letter in 1 Peter. 1 Peter 1, verse 6, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it be tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So we see here that there is a benefit from that suffering. It is a test that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And then he goes on to talk about the sufferings of Christ. He mentions that in verse 11 about the prophets searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them or what was in them was indicating when he testified or when they, the prophets, testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. So we realize that we have a pioneer who knows what it's like, and we heard quite a bit about that in the sermon three weeks ago. But how do you react to suffering and to trials? We remain faithful to God. We find that our faith is tested, and hopefully that faith is strong, and that faith grows, and that faith is active. First Peter, the second chapter, tells us how we should take correction and how we react to suffering and t- trials. Second Peter, First Peter 2, starting with verse 19. For this is commendable if because of conscience towards God one endures grief, suffering wrongfully. For what credit is it when you are beaten for your faults, you take it patiently? So again, these are the lessons of life. We all should know that when we deserve correction, we should take it patiently. But when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. But how many of us, when we are corrected or we receive trials or persecution unjustly, that we take it patiently? This is one of the lessons of suffering, that we're learning to grow in a godly character that means godly patience, endurance. For if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. For to this you were called before, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. We take it patiently, we realize that Christ suffered for us. But how do we react to persecution? We saw in the sermon a couple weeks ago on praying for one another that if we are persecuted, Christ told us there were three ways to react to that. I won't turn to it, but I'll just remind you, in Matthew 5, verse 44, and Jesus said, But I say unto you, love your enemies. What three things do you do? Bless those who curse you. Secondly, do good to those who hate you. And thirdly, pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. 
We all experience suffering and trials. I've shared this with you before some time ago. It's called attitude, the power of attitude, one of those successories. My wife gave me that as uh, an anniversary gift. It's in my office, a dramatic scene with clouds and lightning bolts, and then the power of attitude. Quote, our lives are not determined by what happens to us, but how we react to what happens. Not by what life brings to us, but by the attitude we bring to life. A positive attitude causes a chain reaction of positive thoughts, events, and outcomes. It is a catalyst, a spark that creates extraordinary results. And so we think about how do we react to our suffering, to trials, to persecution. And of course, James says that we fall into many different kinds of trials. We'll read that scripture later. And you may be familiar, you may want to write it down with Psalm 49, 19, 34, 19. Psalm 34, 19, many are the afflictions of the righteous. So it's common. It's not unusual. It's not strange when we fall among different trials and sufferings. But the rest of that verse in Psalm 34, 19 says, but the eternal, the Lord, delivers him out of them all. So one of the lessons perhaps you're beginning to understand, if you haven't already, is that when we suffer, it helps us to have a deeper concern and relationship with God and Christ. Romans, the eighth chapter, if you'll turn there, not only do Christians suffer, we know that the whole world is suffering. Romans, the eighth chapter, and how many of us have shed tears when we realize some of the pain and the atrocities that are committed in various oppressive nations with dictators. Romans 8, the eighth, uh, Romans 8, starting with verse 18. The Apostle Paul realized, here's my attitude toward suffering. What's your attitude? Romans 8, verse 18. For I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And so as we need to always have that big picture, the vision of the future. And of course, we're looking forward to the Feast of Tabernacles that helps us to have that vision of tomorrow's world. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. Mankind has had 6,000 years of experimentation with business, with finance, with government, with education, with art, literature, and science. And mankind has suffered from his own way rather than choosing God's way. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. That's you and me. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Verse 21, because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Because you know the way of liberty. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free, Jesus said in John 8, verse 31. For we know that the whole creation, verse 22, groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. When we look back at even our recent history, World War I, 10 million died. World War II, 55 million died. The Iraq-Iran War, 1 million died. And of course, at that time, I was reading, and you probably remember as well, that both sides would put children in the army affront in a battle so that the children would die and the, the veteran soldiers would still be alive to carry on the war. Horrible. And then the Persian Gulf War, coalition armies expelled Saddam Hussein and his armies from Kuwait, and hundreds of thousands of Iraqis were killed by modern technology mod high-tech weaponry. We had the opportunity in Milwaukee, uh, no, it was Kenosha, Wisconsin, we visited a, a Civil War museum which emphasized the role of the upper Midwest of the United States in the Civil War. But more than 600,000, mostly men, died in the Civil War in the 19th century. 
and about two-thirds of them were from disease because of lack of medical services. Well, if God is so powerful is a classic question, why doesn't He stop all these evils from happening? One answer is process theology, which is a false theology. And that theology states that God had the power to create the universe, but He does not have power to stop evil. In other words, God is limited, and so that explains why we have all this evil. He can't do anything about it. No, God allows what is happening, and He will stop that evil when you read Revelation, the 19th chapter, with the armies, and we will be part of His army to put down all the rebellion and all the, all the armies of the earth that fight against Him at His coming. He has that power. And Jesus said in Matthew 28, 18, all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth, or in the King James, all power has been given to me. The answer is that God has given us the freedom to choose. In fact, He has forced human beings to choose, to either choose the way of man, the way of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, or God's commandments and His way of life. Why? so that we could learn lasting lessons for all eternity and grow in godly character. The angels did not have that time to grow in godly character. God is giving us that time that we can learn lessons for all eternity. You might refer to sermon number 399, God's greatest creation. The scriptures tell us to count the cost, that we can expect to suffer. But more importantly, we need to learn the lessons of suffering and lasting lessons from those trials. In the remainder of the sermon, we'll try to consider ten lessons that will overlap and blend into one another. But are there benefits to suffering? There are short-term benefits, but there are also eternal benefits from suffering. If we're willing to learn, if we're willing to understand. Dr. Meredith has shared this beautiful attitude when he had his stroke. He said, I want to learn whatever lessons I can learn. What lessons have you learned from trials and suffering? What lessons perhaps are you learning? Lesson number one, suffering from God's correction. Number one, correction benefits us. What lessons, lasting lessons of suffering? We suffer when God corrects us. Let's turn to Hebrews. Well, I should tell you the correction with love chapter. You all know what that is, so I don't need to tell you that it's Hebrews 12. You all automatically turn there. Hebrews 12, the correction with love chapter, starting with verse 3. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself. You think about Christ's sufferings. Uh, I didn't see the whole movie Passion, but uh, someone showed me an excerpt from it. And just to see the lictor, the scourging that Christ took, that when you see the typical pictures of Jesus' crucifixion, he looks pretty smooth his skin except for a little drop of blood from the crown of thorns and maybe a little drop of blood from the side where uh, he was speared. But when you saw that part of that movie, when I saw a part of that movie, every part of his face, every part of his body was scourged and scraped. It tells us, of course, in Isaiah 52 and Isaiah 53 that he was marred, his visage was marred more than any man. Mr. Hernandez spoke about that in a sermon a few weeks ago. So here in, first, in Hebrews, the 12th chapter, we consider him, Christ, who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you be weary and discouraged in your own souls. All of us get discouraged from time to time. We had a sermon some time ago, encourage one another. Verse 4, you, you have not yet resisted to bloodshed striving against sin, and you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks unto you as to sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord. You know, when I've been corrected, I tend to not like it. I don't know how you feel. Nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by Him. You know, God corrects us. I've 
been corrected strongly. I, even a couple weeks ago, and I haven't even told my wife how I was corrected. For whom the Lord loves, He chastens and scourges every son whom He receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening of whom, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. And so our human fathers have corrected us. Shall we not much more be readily in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? What's the benefit of it? He goes on in verse 10 to tell us that we may be partakers of His holiness. Verse 11, now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Yes, painful. Nevertheless, afterward, there's a benefit. It yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Correction is painful, but it's beneficial. Dr. Meredith wrote in the Living Church News, January, February 2009, in his editorial, What is Deep Conversion? He writes, God reveals to us the kind of attitude He wants in Isaiah 57, 15. For thus says the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place with Him, who has a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. And Dr. Meredith writes, the word contrite has to do with deep heartfelt repentance, a willingness to acknowledge and to take correction. The basic attitude of total surrender to God, of being willing to admit it and repent when one is wrong, this is the key attitude of which I am speaking. Although, God, although keeping God's commandments and showing love to fellow man is the way of life that must be followed, this key attitude of self-abnegation abnegation, and a willingness to take correction is truly discerning the depth of a person's conversion. And some of those of you who have uh, those lists of memorized scriptures or uh, memor memorizing uh, scriptures, Jeremiah 23 is one of those O oh Lord, I know the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man who walks to direct his own steps. And sometimes I say, well, Father, I don't know which way to go. What way do you want me to go? It's not within man to direct his own steps. And Jeremiah goes on in Jeremiah 10, 24. O oh, eternal, correct me. But with justice, I always ask with mercy and uh, add mercy to the justice part when I ask God for a correction. Not in your anger, lest you bring me to nothing. And I thank God for His correction. His correction has saved my life, probably, many times because of my uh, mistakes and errors. I get ahead of myself, but I told you the story before about trying to set a new uh, record with my 51 Chevy with bald tires, you know, trying to set a record getting back to college from vacation from my home in Meriden, Connecticut to Troy, New York. And uh, it was a rainy day. I had bald tires on the 51 Chevy and going around this fast curve I spun out and here was this huge milk truck that didn't give way. And I crashed into it. I later had to appear in court and uh, was fined for not granting the right of way to the milk truck. And uh, I was fined $9. But, uh, you know, it taught me a lesson. You know, I broke a law. I was corrected because those, uh, you just don't go speeding with bald tires in a rainy road. I hope that we all learn lessons from our mistakes and from our sins. But whenever I ask God for correction, He gives it to me. And I'm always hesitant to ask God for correction because I know it's coming. And yet I know it's good for me. Because the long term is going to benefit me, either saving my life from some kind of physical weakness that might end up in a life-threatening accident of some sort. Let's turn to 2 Timothy 3. You, you all know this. We're still on lesson number one, that correction benefits us. When God gives us correction, we suffer. We may experience pain. But it gives us short-term and long-term benefits. Second Corinthians, I'm sorry, Second Timothy three, and verse sixteen. And one of those 
memorization scriptures. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for what? Doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Has God's word ever corrected you? It should, if you're teachable, if you want to go on the right paths of righteousness. So we just discussed briefly the first of lasting lessons of suffering, and that is number one, correction benefits us. And these overlap. Number two, we learn the reality of cause and effect. We learn the reality of cause and effect. I just mentioned the one of my auto accident. It seems, uh, let's turn to Proverbs, the 22nd chapter, Proverbs 22. You know, when I was a young boy, at certain stages in, my, in our lives, we um, have certain weaknesses. I was accident prone for a little while. I even walked into a door and got a black eye. And uh, of course, uh, my friends were kidding me, uh, you know, who did I get in a fight with, this type of thing. But here in Proverbs, the 22nd chapter, verse 3, a prudent man foresees evil and hides himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. There is cause and effect. You know, when I worked for Chicago Bridge and Iron uh, Company, I uh, was working on what was called a Horton Sphere, an 80 foot diameter uh, steel gas holder in Stamford, Connecticut. 1.2 inch thick steel. You build the huge sphere starting with the equator and then you cantilever up and cantilever down. And of course we were up about 40 or 50 feet and I was doing x-rays of welds. You weld these huge sections and then they were sticking out from the wall were certain bolts or uh, little metal extensions. And we are of course required to wear helmets. It was a good thing because I was walking around and, and bumped into one of these metal extensions and put a big dent in the helmet of, that I was wearing. If I didn't have that helmet, it would have been a dent in my skull. You realize when you experience pain, the reality of cause and effect. And we sometimes learn from our own experiences. We, of course, need to understand that we are facing different disasters that are coming, and we should be prepared for them, to prepare for drinking water for a week and to have those emergency kits ready and available. In fact, the upcoming Living Church News, Dr. Meredith emphasizes the matter of preparation, and we have a section in the September-October Living Church News, which you'll be receiving in a few more weeks, uh, that gives guidelines on preparations for natural disasters. As I said, in my surveys, I find that just very few, a small percentage, are really prepared for them. Anything can happen anywhere. We need to be prepared with disaster supply kits and guide to citizen prepar preparedness. Uh, Dr. Meredith writes in that article, remember in doing our part, we need to take proper action to protect ourselves and our families. May God inspire us all to take action and do our part in every way, yet seeking God more than ever, so that we are walking with God and can then have His protection and His guidance in the days just before the final events of the age occur, as they surely will. And so, you are being warned, and if you prepare for disasters by having extra drinking water, emergency kits, and following those guidelines, you will be prepared. A prudent man, Proverbs 22, 3, foresees evil and hides himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. And we know all the way from Genesis to Revelation, the theme of the Bible is blessings for obedience, cause and effect, and curses for disobedience. Of course, Jesus said in John 10, 10, that we've come that we can have life and have it more abundantly. And yet we are exposed to a worldly environment. We have, I was watching uh, a preview of a movie uh, recently. And uh, you think about AT, is it ADD, Attention Deficit Disorder. And years ago when we were learning teaching techniques, we were told, look, 
1980 when I was teaching at uh, SEP, the Summer Educational Program in Orem, Minnesota, you have different teaching techniques for the children ages 12 to 18 because their attention is very short. So you really need to change the teaching technique every five minutes. Well, in this particular movie, the scene was changing every second. It was an action uh, science fiction movie preview that I was watching, and I was counting it. One, two, every scene, every single second was a different scene, a different uh, angle of the action that was going on. And once there was a five second scene, I couldn't believe it. For five seconds, they left the camera running at the same location. It just impose on our brains and minds this intense kind of change of mind. As we've been discussing here recently that uh, our children are just exposed to the electronic world. And do they ever get out into the wilderness? Do they get out, thankfully, in our preteen um, camp that you heard about, uh, they had an introduction to astronomy. Here children are able to take, hey, look, here are the heavens. There is something out there. There's a constellation. There's the North Star. I appreciate my parents taking me out and my sister and, you know, walking out in the woods. And I remember my dad taking a little bit of uh, birch bark. And, and now you can taste that. This is a birch taste. And, you know, you get that exposure to the outside. I was... Uh, you know, even as children, even to this day, I, I marvel at cloud formations. And, uh, you know, and when we were children, we had plenty of time. And so some of that time we would lie on the grass and just look up at the clouds and just enjoy the various cloud formations. Um, you know, Charlie Brown and Lucy were doing that. They were on the ground looking at the beautiful cloud formations. and. And Lucy, uh, Charlie says to Lucy, what, what, what does that cloud formation remind you of? And Lucy says, that reminds me of uh, Genghis Khan and uh, his thousands of army men on horses climbing over the mountain. And then she says, oh, well, Charlie Brown, what does that cloud remind you, uh, those clouds remind you of? Oh, it reminds me of a cat, a dog, and a puppy. So we have different perceptions and levels of perception. But nonetheless, it's still, when we get exposed to God's creation, as David said, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, what is man that you're mindful of and that you care for him? Because you have a reality check. You understand that God has created the universe as an environment for human beings to learn to fear God and to keep his commandments. It tells us in Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13. That's the whole man, to fear God and keep his commandments. So number two in our suffering, we learn cause and effect, the reality of cause and effect. And sometimes that pain teaches us we won't repeat the same mistake. Number three, we learn that our sin can cause us pain. It's, again, these overlap. At age 11, well, we'll turn to Galatians, the sixth chapter. And I've told you this story before, I think. We were just discussing our childhood uh, days back in the, the 40s, uh, where there was no problem of children predators. You could go, our parents, we had a neighborhood of maybe 14 or 15 children. Uh, maybe 10 of us would get on the bus and go down to the beach in the summer. No parental supervision. We even stay there even in, uh, late in the evening uh, sometime to see the fireworks. But uh, I thought I would try something new. And uh, I think I was about 11 years old. And at Ocean Beach Park in New London, Connecticut, they put a quarter in the vending machine and I got a pack of cigarettes. And I thought, this is, I'm going to try to experiment this. So I started smoking and, well, that was really something. I smoked the whole pack of cigarettes. And I was ill. I was very, very ill. And I never smoked another cigarette after that. You learn our sin can cause us pain. Galatians 6 and verse 7. Galatians 6 verse 7. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked for whatever a man sows that he will also reap. It is a natural law like the law of gravity. You can't get around it. Whatever you sow, you're going to reap. 
For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. Yes, you're going to suffer pain. You're going to suffer a penalty. I suffered from smoking that whole pack of cigarettes. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. We learn that our sin can cause us pain. And of course, there's a classic story of Daniel and King Nebuchadnezzar where, well, we might, no, I don't think we'll turn back there, but I'll just quote one of the uh, verses from there when the prophet Daniel told Nebuchadnezzar, you need to break off of your sins. But he was still proud, and of course, as you know the story, he was walking around Great Babylon, and he said, look what I have built. Is this not Great Babylon that I have built for a royal dwelling by my mighty power and for the honor of my majesty? And while the word was still in his mouth, a voice came from heaven saying, King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken, the kingdom has departed from you, and they shall drive you from men, and your dwelling shall be as the beasts of the field. They shall make you eat grass with oxen, seven times shall pass over you. What lesson? Until you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomever he chooses. In that very hour, Nebuchadnezzar was driven from men and ate grass like oxen. His body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hair had grown like eagle's feathers and his nails, nails like bird's claws. So he learned from his sin. He learned the pain from his sin. In verse 37, he says, Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the King of heaven, all whose works are truth and his ways justice. And those who walk in pride, he is able to put down. I know, because I've experienced Nebuchadnezzar saying to himself. Let's turn to 1 Peter, the fourth chapter, 1 Peter 4. We, uh, again, this principle that we suffer because we sin. We learn that our sin can cause us pain. 1 Peter, the fourth chapter, and verse 1. And again, time and time, we see the confirmation that Christ suffered for us. Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh... Arm yourselves also with the same mind, for he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. When you put your hand on a hot stove, you're not going to put your hand on a hot stove once it's burned. And, uh, you know, we learn little lessons. I, I love uh, Mexican food, and uh, I like salsa, so the red salsa, so much that I could almost drink it. But I found out that it really had a bad reaction in my stomach. So I had to write down, don't drink salsa. You know. <laughs> he that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. I don't do that anymore. So lesson number three, we learned that our sin can cause us pain. Number four is we learned that pain, we learn pain resulting from others' sins. It may not be our fault. We have undeserved suffering. First Peter, the second chapter we already read. You take it patiently, but when you do good and suffer, you take it patiently. What lesson are we to learn when we suffer when it's undeserved? First Peter, the third chapter, verse 13, first Peter, first Peter 3, verse 13. And who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you are blessed and do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. We have to take positive action in response to persecution, as we already said, to love our enemies, to bless those who curse us, and to do good to hate those who hate us, and pray for those that despitefully use us. In the Old Testament, it was an eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth, and a hand for a hand, and a foot for a foot, burn for burn, and wound for wound, stripe for stripe. That was in Exodus 21, verses 24 through 25. But that's not the Christian approach. God will 
give vengeance to those who don't repent. And we saw, as you sow to the flesh, you will of the flesh reap corruption. But what is the lesson that we learn when we suffer from others' sins? We unjustifiably are pained and suffered. Well, first of all, we can understand the hurt and pain that we have inflicted on others when we undeservably get hurt or experience pain from others' sins. Lesson number four is we learn the pain resulting from others' sin. Lesson five, we'll move ahead here. We learn to have compassion for others. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians, the 10th chapter. When we understand that we experience the common pain of all humanity, we can have compassion for others. As some who are in pain will say, well, Mr. Ames, you just don't understand the pain I'm going through from this cancer. Well, no, I didn't have the pain from cancer, but I had extreme painful back injury that continued to cause me to yell out to God for mercy and for His intervention. So I know what pain is like. I may have not experienced the same cause of the pain, but I know pain. And so we learn to have compassion for others. 1 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, verse 11. Now all these things were happened to them as examples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. You've got to be in constant contact with God. No temptation has overtaken you. Notice this, except such as is common to man. So if you experience pain, it isn't something that is unique in the history of humanity. Everyone has experienced some kind of pain, normally. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. And so we learn that compassion. 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, verse 24. He's talking about the body here, is the church. 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 24. But God composed the body, having given greater honor to that part which lacks it, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. And if you haven't got verse uh, 26 marked, if you haven't marked it, you should. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are the body of Christ and members individual, individually. 1 Corinthians, the first chapter. So we as a family, as the church, as a congregation should have that care, concern, and compassion for others. We learn when we experience pain to have compassion on those who also experience pain. 1 Corinthians, the first chapter, starting with verse 3. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which is given to you uh, by Christ Jesus, that you were enriched in everything by Him in all utterance and all knowledge." Actually it was looking for uh, chapter, I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians, the first chapter. But I hope you've benefited from that reading. 2 Corinthians 1 and uh, verse 3, "'Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tri tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounds through Christ. So we are, should be able to comfort those who are in any trouble. And on the other side of the coin, we need to make sure that we are not causing uh, pain. You know, there was some time ago in the comic strips, I would call it black or blue uh, comic strips, just making fun of 
pain or causing others, those who had disabilities, uh, to cause them to stumble or have them pain. Just a terrible attitude and a terrible approach. I won't turn there, but Leviticus 19.14 says, Don't put a stumbling block before the blind. And in Deuteronomy 15, he says, Don't harden your heart from helping a poor brother. So we need to make sure that we have the sobriety of being careful and caring for those who have disabilities or who have handicaps. And we need to help those who are mourn, to comfort those who mourn. We have uh, an article called Comfort in Times of Tragedy. If you go on our website and just put in the search keyword comfort, you can find that article Comfort in Times of Tragedy. We realize that as priests in God's coming kingdom, that we will be able to identify with those human beings who come out of the Great Tribulation. Uh, some, of course, have been rebels and have been humbled, and they loathe themselves, as it says in Ezekiel, the 36th chapter. And they've learned from their pain and their suffering to be humble. But let's just take a quick look at Isaiah 40 and realize that part of our responsibility as priests will be not only to teach God's law, the statutes and judgments, but also to intercede for others. That we are priests as Christ is the great intercessor. And here in Isaiah, the 40th chapter, verse 10, Behold, the Lord eternal shall come with a strong hand, and his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his work before him. He will feed his flock with, like a shepherd, and will gather the lambs with his arm, and carry them in his bosom, and gently lead those who are with young. You have the various attitudes all the way from those who have been the victims of the Holocaust, who will come up in the white throne judgment, they will need comforting. And if you've gone through pain and suffering and you have compassion, you will be able to comfort them. And Christ is viewed here as the wonderful shepherd who will carry these lambs in his bosom and gently lead those who are with young. As priests in God's kingdom, we'll be able to show compassion and love towards those who are victims of oppression and injustice. Jessica Hart, who died at age 11 and a half, and millions of other children who died young, will have a new life. And they'll have a full opportunity to fulfill their incredible human potential. So lesson number five, we learn to have compassion for others as we participate in the sufferings common to all humanity. Number six, we learn to share in Christ's sufferings. <clears throat> I already referred to Isaiah 52 that the Messiah was marred in his visage among all. I remember a quotable quote from Mr. Hernandez's sermon a couple weeks ago. Speaking of Christ's sufferings and now that he's at God's right hand, Mr. Hernandez said, quote, someone up there knows, end of quote. So when you're in pain and suffering, you know that our great high priest, Christ Jesus, is up there at the right hand of God who knows what you're suffering, what you are going through. But we also participate in Christ's sufferings, as it says here in 1 Peter, the fourth chapter, 1 Peter 4, 1 Peter the fourth chapter, and, and of course I sure remember that January of 1979 when we had quite a few different tragedies and trials. 1 Peter 4 and verse 12, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you, but rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. How many of you, when you suffer, when you're in pain, think, I am experiencing and sharing Christ's sufferings because he pained like I am painting and even more intensely. And so we partake in Christ's sufferings. We should remember that when we are suffering. Let's turn back to uh, 
Romans the 8th chapter, Romans 8. And starting in, uh, well, just verse 16, Romans 8, 16. The Spirit itself, as it should read, bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. What an incredible high calling that we have. Uh, the other versions, co-heirs with Christ, joint heirs with Christ, if if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. As we read previously, verse 18, For I consider that the sufferings of this time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed in us. Well, lesson number six is we learn to share in Christ's sufferings. Lesson number seven, we learn to desire the kingdom more. We are taught to pray by Jesus through the Father, your kingdom come. Can you off the top of your head say, well, I want your kingdom to come because of. And it just seems every single day, maybe I miss a day or so, I read something in the papers or hear something in the news or experience something that says in my heart and mind, your kingdom come, almost an involuntary prayer to God for his kingdom to come. The violence, the oppression, Satan's counterfeit Christianity, the false values, deceptions, the evolution-based education, the poverty, disease, the pollution, the pollution of human minds. It says in Proverbs 8.13, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride and arrogance in the evil way in the perverse mouth do I hate. Mr. Hernandez referred to this, but let's turn back to it in Ezekiel, the ninth chapter in verse 4. Ezekiel 9 and verse 4. We desire the kingdom to come because we see all of the pain and suffering and evil of man's experimentation over these 6,000 years that is just going to end in cosmicide unless there is an elect and unless Christ does intervene. Ezekiel 9. Verse 4, and here are these uh, spirit beings that go around at the instruction of God. Verse 4, Ezekiel 9, And the Eternal said to him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh and cry over all the abominations that are done within it. And to the others he said in my hearing, go after him through the city and kill. Let not your eyes spare, nor have pity. Utterly slay old and young, maidens and little children and women. But do not come near any on whom is the mark and begin at my sanctuary. So God is going to protect those who have this kind of attitude, as the Apostle Paul said, you know, Abhor evil, or eschew evil, as it in the King James Version. Abhor evil, love good. God is going to protect those who are not just neutral in their attitudes towards society. Because we get inured, we get hardened with all of the media influence upon us, and we compromise. I've told you before about the Shocking story in Economist magazine it was March 6 through the 12th, 2010. And the cover, gender side. What happened to 100 million baby girls? Goes on to say in the article of this selective abortion, it is no exaggeration to call this gender side. Women are missing in their millions, aborted, killed, neglected to death. As we read earlier, the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs. And so we see those nations, particularly China and India, that are guilty of those missing women and baby girls. And we need to get upset at it and to realize this is abhorrent. 
God must come to intervene and bring this earth the kind of peaceful government from His saints to learn the way to peace. It's not the way of get, it's the way of give, the way of serving, the way of His commandments of loving God and loving neighbor as a self, not destroying or abandoning or selling little girl babies, not to mention the millions of other abortions as well. Lesson number seven, through our pain and suffering, we learn to desire the kingdom more. Lesson number eight, we learn patience through our suffering. James, the first chapter, let's turn back to James, you know that very familiar exhortation of how to respond to trials and tests. James 1, verse 2, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Now, it's very difficult to count it all joy, but when I am in a trial, I say, okay, uh, let's see if we can count it, <laughs> count it all joy. I mentioned to you the time when we were, my wife and I were driving at night, and this is many years ago, and we were going to pull off on the side of the road and got stuck in some mud and uh, couldn't get out. It was dark, no one around. Count it joy, count it joy. <laughs> no solution to the problem. Uh, of course, we prayed and saw a light in a farmhouse up the road, so I walked up to the farmhouse, and a farmer was very kind and helpful to get his tractor and pull us out of, the, out of the mud. But it was difficult to count it joy. But God says, count it joy, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Let patience have its perfect work, and complete lacking nothing. That's one thing that we, we as the Western world do not have is patience. We want to keep, you know, it's just got to be fast moving all the time. I remember the story of one of our church members back in Worldwide years ago. He was to have a visit in Bangkok in Thailand, but he lived in Burma. In order to get there, he had to walk, whether over mountains or trails for I don't know how many hours to get to a river a depot where he got the, uh, the boat that would take him down to Bangkok and to meet our minister there. And the boat only went once a day. And so he got there just an hour after the boat had left. How would we react? We would be pretty upset, frustrated. He in the typical, from what I understand, the typical Asian uh, tradition, folded his arms and legs and waited 23 hours till the next boat came along. I don't think we would be that patient, but he was. How patient are you? That's one of the fruits of the Spirit, and of course it tells us in 1 Corinthians 13, 4, love suffers long. So you think, yes, I'm suffering from the uh, obnoxiousness of this personality over here, or I'm suffering because of A, B, and C, uh, because of personal relationships. But love suffers long and is kind. The NIV says love is patient, love is kind. Just remember that law of radiant health, too, that I remind myself when I'm frustrated and traffic and uh, can't move and I'm late. Maintain a positive and tranquil mind, I keep telling myself. Maintain a positive and tranquil mind. That was one of those laws of radiant health that Dr. Meredith wrote about years ago. Luke, the 14th chapter, I referred to this before, but counting the cost. We have to per persevere with patience, and some of us have disabilities and handicaps. We're limited, and we learn patience. We learn long-suffering. Luke, the 14th chapter, and verse 26. Luke 14, verse 26. If anyone comes to me and does not hate or love less by comparison, his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, Yes, in his own life also he cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Well, some of us have crosses to bear. They may be a, a, a tense family situation. It may be a physical debility or impairment. 
And I think of uh, paraplegics. Dr. Meredith has told the story of the healing of Howard Clark, who was in a wheelchair and couldn't walk and was anointed by Mr. Dick Armstrong and Howard Clark was able to walk and to carry his babies in his arms. But for some, God is not healed. Some have one leg, some have one arm. Many of the paraplegics and, and of course, uh, disabled veterans from wars have an arm or a leg missing. And yet, many of them demonstrate a positive attitude that some of us, that puts some of us to shame. Uh, some one legged uh, individuals go snow skiing. I was just reading in the paper this morning that uh, we have a local a wheelchair softball team that is going to Omaha, Nebraska for the uh, national championship. So even people in wheelchairs just don't say, oh, I can't do anything and get depressed. They want to do something. They can even play wheelchair basketball, in this case, wheelchair softball. You have a positive and a tranquil mind. You persevere. And some of you know the one artist who paraplegic who paints beautiful paintings with a, a brush in her mouth because she can't move, doesn't have arms with which to paint. And sometimes when we realize that we've gone, as my wife was mentioning to me when today, when you go through a terrible pain and suffering and even something that might be life-threatening, all the other little picayune, bothersome, little events that happen to you that frustrate you pale in significance to the more deep life-threatening suffering or threat that you've experienced. And you realize, oh, that doesn't bother me anymore. It used to bother me, but doesn't bother me anymore because I've gone through a life-threatening experience and God has delivered me from it. He tells us to run the race with endurance. The lesson number eight is we learn patience, we persevere, and we endure. Lesson number nine is we learn dependence on God. Let's, let's turn to 2 Corinthians, the 11th chapter, 2 Corinthians 11. And we cry out to God for His mercy, for His deliverance. 2 Corinthians, the 11th chapter. I remember one classic case in which one church member had a uh, disease and our church member doctor told her, look, you just need to take a bath and, you know, to help cleanse, cleanse your problem. But she says, I'm just going to sit here until God heals me. In other words, she wasn't going to do a thing. She was putting God on her terms rather than trying to do something that was showing she was going to cooperate and be in harmony with God's laws of radiant health. 2 Corinthians, the 11th chapter, you know the Apostle Paul went through a lot more trials than most of us have ever experienced. Verse 23 of uh, 2 Corinthians 11, Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more in labors, more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequently, in deaths often. Had life-threatening experiences. From the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Stone, three times shipwrecked. A night and a day if I'd been in the deep. Journeys often, perils of waters, robbers, perils of my own countrymen, and perils of the Gentiles, and perils in the city, perils in the wilderness, perils in the sea, and among false brethren. In weariness and toil, and sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Besides the, th the other things, what comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches. Who is weak and I am not weak? Who is made to stumble and I do not burn with indignation? If I must boast, I will boast in the things which concern my infirmity. The God of our God and Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, who is blessed forever, knows I am not lying. And he tells about being rescued in Damascus. So again, he had to trust in God for his life. His life was in God's hands. And sometimes we go to that crossroads in our life when we have to make that decision. We realize, Father, if you want me to die, my life is in your hands. 
And sometimes I, I know that you've turned to first, first Peter, the fourth chapter. Sometimes I know that uh, when I've talked to others, it seems like some of them, uh, it's very rare, but are, are like a masochist. They say, oh yeah, well bring another trial on me, God. I, I just don't understand that particular approach. <laughs> but, you know, and, and I've seen people have gone through trials and why haven't you even asked God for mercy? David says in Psalm 51, have mercy upon me, O God. And some, some of God's people don't even, it doesn't even occur to them in their trial to ask God for mercy. Of course, I learned that in uh, Gilbert and Sullivan's uh, The Mikado because I was Poobah and my one line uh, was uh, there in the Ambassador Corral was, have mercy for Poobah, have mercy for Poobah. That was one of my lines because I was about to be executed by the great Mikado. I learned then, you know, that I need to ask God for mercy. But somehow it doesn't occur to God's people. If you're in pain, we learn dependence on God. We ask for His deliverance. We ask mercy. When I was in pain this past Tuesday for having lifted the suitcases in a wrong way, I was going through a continual pain. And I reminded God, it says in James 5, if any are afflicted, let him pray. And Father, I'm afflicted. I'm suffering. Actually, the King James is any suffering, let him pray. I'm suffering. I'm praying. You know, relieve me of this pain. And about three hours later, he did relieve me of the pain. Suffering teaches us dependence on God. 1 Peter 4, verse 19. Again, one of the most important verses in terms of our very plan and who God is and what He's doing with each and one of each and every one of us as we suffer. Verse 19, 1 Peter 4. Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to Him in doing good as to a faithful Creator. So when you're suffering, you ask God to create in you His, His perfect righteous character. As David said in Psalm 51.10, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. So we ask God to create in us His perfect character. Dr. C. Paul Meredith, an evangelist years ago, was challenged when someone said, Why did God allow this person to suffer? Dr. C. Paul Meredith answered simply, God knows what He's doing. And that's the emphasis of this verse, that you trust God, that He knows what He's doing in perfect, perfecting your character and in your life. Lesson 9, we learn dependence on God. Number 10, and I realize, just realize I'm over time, I'm sorry, but uh, you're just going to have to listen. <laughs> <laughs> Lesson number 10 is we learn repentance. And of course, Job was the classic example of that. God knew that he was loyal, he was faithful, he would endure this trial, but he still had a great lesson to learn. He suffered, he lost most of his possessions, he lost much of his family. He lost his health and he experienced excruciating pain. And God trusted him. But it says in Job 1 verse 22, in all this, Job did not sin nor charge God with wrong. One lesson Job should have learned, and I've pointed this out to you before, Job 30, uh, 42, I'm sorry, Job 32, we have six chapters where this young man, Elihu, who is filled with wrath because Job's three friends were not able to point out the problem. They were accusing Job of things of which he was not guilty. But in Job 30, well, let's turn to Job 34 for, uh, for lack of time. And this one lesson, if you don't know why you're suffering, Job did not know. This is the key of what his attitude should be, should have been, and what our attitude needs to be when we don't understand why we're going through a certain trial. Job 34, verse 31, Elihu tells Job, For has anyone said to God, I have borne chastening? I will offend no more. You don't automatically blame others. You look at yourself. What's wrong with me? 
Teach me, verse 32, what I do not see. If I have done iniquity, I will do no more. Elihu, has anyone said this? This has got to be our attitude. Show me what I need to change. Help me to learn the lessons from my suffering and from my trials. Teach me what I need to learn. We have a reprint article, Trials and Tests, Seven Lessons from the Book of Job by Mr. John H. O'Gwin. I'll just, lesson number seven is, we emerge when we learn what God is teaching. I'll read the last couple paragraphs. A vital lesson, Mr. O'Gwin writes, that all of us must learn in order to please God and to begin emerging from a trial is that of mercy and forgiveness. Job's friends were miserable comforters. Regardless of their motives, they were a great part of Job's trial. Yet notice the turning point when Job began to emerge from his great adversity. Uh, verse 10 of Job 42. And the Lord restored Job's losses when he prayed for his friends. Job came to really know God deeply, not simply to know about him. He became a far more humble and compassionate man as a result of what he went through. Learning these lessons was the key to his emerging out of the dark shadows of life and into the sunlight once again. Our trials can make us bitter or they can make us better. Which will yours do for you? And that's from seven lessons from the book of Job, uh, John O'Gwen. And you can get that on our website, of course, just by, uh, again, uh, doing a search on lessons of Job. So, brethren, suffering does teach us faith. And faith that God knows what he's doing. Dr. Meredith has set us the example that we need to learn whatever lesson we can learn because our eternal character is now forming. Suffering teaches us, or should teach us, deeply the results of right and wrong, the difference between Satan's way and God's way. Suffering tests our commitment to God, and it tests our character. And in the process, we also experience the love, the grace, the mercy, and the deliverance of God. Suffering teaches us the pain that Christ suffered for us, because it's by his stripes we were healed. God is creating in us his nature, his character. We learn la lasting lessons. We learn that we are being transformed into the very image and character of Christ, Romans 8, 29. The world is full of pain and suffering. The creation groans waiting for the liberty that will come from God's children. So remember Matthew 24, 13, he that endures to the end, the same shall be saved. And Romans 8, 18, that the sufferings of this time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed in us. One last verse, and that is Revelation 21 and verse 4. We look forward to the day when peace, love, and prosperity will cover the earth. Let's learn deeply the lasting lessons of suffering and look forward to the ultimate joy when the endless cycle of suffering and death will end as it brings out here in Revelation 21 and verse 4. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Brethren, let's learn the lessons from your suffering and my suffering. Let's grow in the glorious and loving character of Christ.